Okay, I call this meeting to order um, for November 5th, 2018, the work session for the York County School Board. Hope everyone had a good past few days when it was warm, nice warm weather out, but then we the rain came in and now it's getting colder and of course the time changed, so that's really um, hitting a lot of people, I think. But anyway, we're going to move on with our um, presentations. We have, we have several for tonight, and the first one is the updates on our strategic plan. Dr. Shandler is going to share additional information on the first. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Good evening, board members. Good evening, staff. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start this evening with the strategic plan status update on goal one, um, objective 1-8, digital competencies. And, pre and that presentation this evening is going to be led by Dr. Karen Cagle, Associate Director of Technology and Innovation. I'll turn it over to Dr. Cagle. Good evening, Mr. Richardson, members of the board, and Dr. Chandler. Tonight, I will pro provide the strategic plan status update addressing the integration of digital competencies into grade level curriculum. As adults, we know that we use technology every day for such things as shopping, banking, emailing, and more. It is in every facet of our work and personal life. Because of this, we know it is important to not only teach our students how to perform basic operations, we need to develop their safe and responsible use of digital resources along with their ability to effectively research, problem solve, and communicate. <coughs> our strategic plan states that by FY22, YCSD will develop and implement a continuum of digital competencies integrated across grade levels. Whereas our teachers are, are already doing this, the integration of these competencies into the curriculum further ensures that all students are prepared for the workplace and life in general. Using the VDOE computer technology standards, YCSD staff created a matrix which outlines the knowledge and skills necessary for students to effectively use technology resources. The matrix you see here is part of the technology research strand, one of five strands. As I walk through the next couple of slides, you'll see how the skills build from one grade level to the next. So let's take a look. So here in grades K, one and two, they're, they're shaded a light yellow, and that means we're going to teach our students in those grades how to recognize that information may be presented as print text, electronic text, audio, video, or images. And then our goal is that this will be maintained through grades 3 through 12. <clears throat> so beyond recognizing that the information may be presented as this different type of text or other media, we want them in grades three through five to conduct research using the various types of text and media-based information. Then when they get to middle school, we want them to determine when further research is needed based on original search results and first drafts. So we're going to teach this in middle school and they'll carry it through to the other grade levels. And in grades 9 through 12, explicit instruction focuses on higher level thinking skills to interpret online information. This is just one example within the technology research strand of how the skills progressively build from kindergarten to grade 12. So the next step was to take these matrices and align them with the content standards to create curriculum addendums with appropriate activities at each grade level. On this slide, you see a 10th grade example. Here students in a biology class are applying knowledge to interpret online primary sources such as journal articles, graphs, charts, and video while conducting research on cell theory. The addendums have been shared with teachers through our intranet along with current curriculum documents for teacher reference. This slide shows the plan for moving the digital competencies from those addendums to the curriculum. As you can see this past summer, our curricul curriculum writers met to revise the K-5 through English curriculum where they included the digital competencies. In 20, uh, during this school year, our secondary English will revise curriculum and our math um, will as well. 
And then in summer of 2019, <coughs> social studies and science will revise curriculum. And then summer 2020 is when we expect it to be the, the competencies <coughs> being integrated in all the core content areas. To support implementation, as always, professional development is a critical component of success and will be provided to teachers and administrators later this year and into next. Additionally, a classroom observation checklist will be developed this year and implemented in FY20 to help our teachers and our administrators identify effective integration of the digital competencies. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share this work. I'll open it up for questions at this time. It seems fascinating. Good luck. You've got some work ahead of you to do. Yes, ma'am. I want to, I've visited eight elementary schools up to this point, and I just want to commend the district on the incorporation of technology. Some, some of the things that they're doing at some of these schools are just phenomenal. So congratulations on that. Now that I've buttered you up, can I get a copy of the matrix, you think, digitally? Sure. Okay, let's put it in Friday notes. Okay, thanks. All right, no other questions. Thank you, Dr. Cagle. Appreciate Thank that you. presentation. It was very good. Thank um, you, Dr. Cagle. Dr. Cagle. So now we're going to uh, Dr. Shandor, more about the next update. Yes, so the next presentation, while we're transitioning, <laughs> we're going to bring Dr. Uh, Aaron Butler up to the table, Director of School Administration. He's going to present again a strategic plan update on Goal 4-4. Uh, behavior referrals. So, Dr. Dr. Butler, I'll let you go ahead. And, okay. Thank you. Mr. Richardson, members of the board, and Dr. Shandor, thank you for this opportunity this evening to present updates to strategic plan goal four, specifically objective four. Under goal four, under school culture, the division has made a commitment to foster effective partnerships with families and the community to make sure there is positive relationships between staff, students, and families. Specifically for objective four, looking at programs and protocols to help reduce discipline referrals, as well as focusing on exclusionary practices and disproportionality when it comes to discipline. Tonight, I'll be going over three practices that we have implemented one is called School-Wide Information System, known as SWIS. The implementation of Virginia Tiered System of Supports, called BTSS, and then professional development opportunities we have provided for staff. SWIS, or the School-Wide Information System, was developed by the University of Oregon, and it is a confidential, web-based information system that helps schools collect their discipline and behavior data in order to make decisions about how to improve conditions in their school. Just as we have information for academics where we can look at um, test scores and then make some decisions about interventions, SWIS allows school administrators to use that same technique and problem solving method when it comes to behaviors and conduct of students. SWIS empowers school based teams to look at the how, how often do referrals occur, the what, what problem behaviors occur the most, the where, the when, and which students are involved in referrals and disciplinary matters. I'm going to go through a demonstration with you this evening. So whenever administrators pull up their dashboard, this is what SWIS provides for them. And you can see when they log in, they can look at different reports. And so I'm going to walk through, this is the demo that we use for training with our school administrators. And so I'll walk you through a drill down tonight. So based on the data for August 1st through October 26th, we can see that in this particular demo school that there are several areas that we need to focus on. I'm going to drill down to seventh grade because that seems to be the highest proportion of disciplinary infractions. And so when we isolate all the infractions that occurred in the seventh grade, we can then drill down to see what locations did the majority of those infractions occur. And we can see from the diagram they occurred in the commons area. So we're going to drill down into the commons to see what exactly was going on in the commons for seventh grade students. Using the drill down function, we can see that at 9 o'clock, at 10.30, and at 1 o'clock, there were some spikes in disciplinary activity uh, in the commons for seventh grade students. And we can see that the majority of behaviors that were being displayed was harassment, physical aggression, and inappropriate language. Using this drill down, we can then make some conclusions. 
So in general, people might make the comment, well, students at our school are out of control and are always in the hallways causing problems after every class. This is an opinion not based on fact. What Swiss allows schools is to make an analysis statement during the first quarter of the 2018-19 school year, 20% of all discipline infractions were generated by seventh grade students. A high frequency of the infractions occurred in the commons during the time intervals of 9 o'clock, 10.30, and 1 o'clock p.m. The main inappropriate behaviors displayed are harassment, inappropriate language, and physical aggression. Using this analysis statement, they can then engage in problem solving. So using the Swiss matrix, you can see that they ask once you put the analysis statement down, your goal could be, we're going to reduce infractions for seventh graders by 50% in the commons. And then you work through how are you going to accomplish that goal. So we'll take prevention. What action steps will we take for prevention? It could be increased supervision in the commons during those peak times that were shown on the graph. Who's going to be responsible for taking care of this? Is it going to be administrators or teachers? By when, so when are we going to start to implement this change? How are we going to make sure that it's being measured with fidelity or actually being done in a reliable manner? And then are there any notes or updates with this particular situation? For 2017-18 school year, we had several schools that piloted using SWIS. For 2018-19, all of our schools are using SWIS, and currently there are quarterly trainings with school-based staff with SWIS. The Virginia Tier System of Supports, or BTSS, is a comprehensive framework. Um, rather than being a program, it looks at how can we align academics, behavior, and social-emotional wellness. Then using good data and looking at our practices and systems, we can determine the outcomes that we would like for our students and for our staff to create more supportive and effective learning environments. Looking at the graphic that is used by VTSS, we see that when we have routines in place, high expectations for all students, and routines, 80 to 90% of all of our students can function well and be successful in the school setting when it comes to behavior. However, there'll be a small percentage, five to 10%, that's gonna need a little bit more intensified services or targeted interventions so that they can also be successful. And finally, you might have a small percentage, one to 8%, or the few number of students who need the most intensified services. And so they will get those services based on the model that we use. With Virginia Tiered System of Supports, we received a $20,000 grant to help us with professional development and resources for our schools. We also received direct coaching and technical support from the Women Married Technical Training Assistance Center, known as TTAC, and from BCU's Research and Implementation Center, which is the Rick Center. They also provide professional development for our division leadership team and also for our school-based leadership teams. On the division leadership team, or the DLT, we have representation from the school board office, school-based administrators, school counselors, and teachers. The DLT works to make sure that everything that is provided from the division level has common practices, common language, and a common vision and expectations to support an overall positive school community. This past summer, we had our first Tier 1 training for behavior. It was held at the York High School Kiva, and you see a picture here of a school-based team from Yorktown Elementary School that came together to look at their discipline data, to discuss what types of processes and procedures were in place for discipline at their school, and also to look at climate survey data to make some changes for this upcoming school year. Every quarter, we also have coaching meetings with team leaders. As you can see in the picture in the round room, all of our schools were allowed to bring a small team of leaders to receive additional coaching and training <coughs> in BTSS. They included a building administrator, a teacher leader, and in some cases a school counselor or additional staff members such as the assessment and compliance coordinator or the ACI at the elementary level. Through the BTSS grant and through Title IV grant money, Staff was allowed to attend several conferences to help expand our knowledge of PBIS. One was the Applied Positive Behavior Supports Conference that was held back in March, and then just recently the PBIS Implementers Forum that was held in Chicago. In addition, we also have opportunities to attend the VTSS leadership trainings that are held each month throughout the year. Looking ahead to this summer, we're planning on having a training for all the Tier 2 intervention staff. 
They also include a new stipend position called Student Connection Coaches, which was through the Title IV grant to allow to have someone in the building to help students who struggle to connect with the school life or to connect with goals to be there to provide a support mechanism for those students. We also have our assessment and compliance coordinators, our social workers, psychologists, and a variety of appropriate staff which focus on how we support students who are not in that 80 percent of our student population who need more targeted interventions and support to be successful in our schools. Thank you for this opportunity to present an update to go for. I am available for questions at this time. The pilot was last year? Yes, sir. Pretty impressive. It is. What kind of data have you been able to take out? What, 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 what does it say for us with the pilot last year? Has it given us information to go forward with? So one of the things it shared with us, we look particularly at disproportionality because it allows us to run fields for, if we take a population of our different subpopulations and look at the um, number of infractions or suspensions that students had, you can look to see are we disproportionate or if we are actually on target with those enrollment numbers. Uh, York High School uh, recently presented at a state conference where they used their Swiss data to show that they were able through good practices and routines to eliminate their disproportionality in their school and then they had the Swiss data to verify that. Uh, and so it's been really helpful for our schools to get target you know, what areas of our school needs additional supports and then how do we need to maybe change some processes to improve. So things. those infractions, are they based on group kinds of things or the individual how do you define what the infractions are? And is it something that's a general rule from one school, or an infraction in one school is the same as an infraction in another school, so that you're doing apples to apples type of thing? Yeah, so when it comes to our infraction, the major infractions are just the same things out of our student code of conduct. So there's nothing different with those. Um, there's an extra feature in Swiss that allows schools to look at minor infractions. So there are things that necessarily did not end up in a suspension or ATS, but it might be a student that's struggling to show appropriate behaviors. And so you can list, you know, if you did teacher-based uh, detention, if you did a conference with the school counselor. So you can see all the interventions that were used before that student was referred to the main office for an infraction. You just answered my last question because if that would, if we can target students earlier and catch them earlier with infractions, and we could eliminate a lot of the administrative hearings, school board hearings, so to speak. I have two things real quick. One is I sat down with Dr. James and Dr. Butler, and they gave me a, a demo of this. And I encourage each of you to do that if you, if you get the opportunity. It's, it's phenomenal. But let's talk about the disproportion, disproportional index. I know it went down uh, this year. Significantly, do you have a target goal, a target number for that? Because it seems to me, with this, now that we've got all this data at our <coughs> fingertips, you know, like like you were just talking about earlier intervention, but much much more detailed and quality <coughs> intervention as well. So, do we have a target for that number, or the target should always be um, your numbers of suspension or exclusionary practices should never be higher than your actual population of a, of a, of a certain population in your school. So, if a, so you have a population of um, African American students make it 20 percent of your school population. The target is that you shouldn't have suspensions or referrals higher than that 20 percent. And so it's going to be individualized for each school because you base it on each school individual population. Yeah, so let's park there then since you brought that up because two years ago <coughs> The disproportionate index for African American students was 2.6 times, 2.6 percent, which means we have 12 percent uh, population of African American students, but the suspensions were 2.6 times higher, <coughs> which was the highest in the region except for James City County. This past year it went down to 1.7. So that, that's what I was asking, particularly for the African American students. Do we have a target number for that disproportionate index in regards to the population versus the number of suspensions and things of that nature? Well, the target number should be zero. I mean, the target number is we don't want any, but the reality is <clears throat> what Dr. Um, Butler just shared was these smaller behaviors that happen before they get a referral. That's where, as Ms. Haywood stated, that's where the intervention, that's where you want to be able to put some interventions in place. If you take care of the little small things, then the big things don't happen. So I think that's 
with Swiss, now that we have this data at our fingertips and <coughs> we can use this forwarded data to inform us to make decisions along the way, we should expect to see that number go down. Did you want to add to that? Um, like Dr. Chandler said, same, the goal is, uh, is to bring down all suspensions. And that's what the data shows. When you implement the tiered system of support and you really focus on making sure you have a positive school environment where students feel welcome, where they feel like they're connected to school, then you have uh, fewer incidents of misbehaviors. And so by bringing down everybody's um, suspensions and exclusionary practices and keeping students at school, you increase their potential to graduate on time and also to be successful in school. So that's the goal, is to bring down suspension rates for all students. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that. And I said this, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm pie in the sky kind of thing. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the best, worst, best situation. But if we look at our mission statement, we want a quality education for all students. If we say all students, this has got to work for all students, so we have to attempt to make it work for all students and then deal with the infractions as they come. But we're going to have to step up to the plate and say we want all students yeah, that, that to was benefit going to be, from this. And that was going to be my next comment and question, the last one too. Um, <clears throat> so I'm assuming before you got Swiss, you've got some type of baseline. Mm -hmm. um, this is just something for you guys to consider. Is it possible in the future for us to get monthly our work session to get monthly reports on district wide performance based on this data? Or do you run it at such a mic macro level? And that's just something for you to consider. It's not it's not an actual Or item. even something at the end of at in in December and then well in the first semester and then second semester, you know, because that's probably a lot of data yeah. to do it monthly. I know at one point we used to look at it school by school and it was maybe every six months or every three months. I can't recall, but we were getting those paper handouts on yeah. that. Well, Dr. Rutherford, how often do schools review this data? So we've asked schools to review it on a monthly basis because each school has what they call a PBIS support team and so they pull their data and they look at it on a monthly basis. And then when we meet quarterly with our um, team leaders, we also review that data with them on a quarterly basis as well. Um, I will say this was the first implementation. One of the things we learned last year when we piloted is that it's very, sometimes our staff need to go through the process for a couple of months to make sure that they really understand how things are working in Swiss to make sure they're printing the right reports. And so that's what we do about coaching uh, with our staff. Um, the schools that piloted last year are doing a really good job with it. Uh, we are still working with some of our newer schools that are using it to make sure they are using it correctly and printing reports correctly. So maybe in the spring then, Toward the end of the school year, we can we can look at a, a, a comparison set of the data from the schools that piloted it initially because there were what eight or nine uh, schools, eight, mm -hmm. eight. Yeah. and then this year's data, and just from those schools that piloted because we have we have a history now, just to, just to gauge you know the performance and see how we stand. And that seem reasonable. I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't think that's, that's, yeah, that's easy. We can, we can do that. Do you want that back as a presentation? Do you want that in your <coughs> notes? What do you, what's the I best? Would for a I would like it at a work session. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's a great tool for us to, to meet that goal that we're trying to meet. So the, the program certainly is, is working, it sounds like, from some of the school's implementation of it. So uh, I'm comfortable with that, too. But thank you. Any additional questions? All Thank right. you, Dr. Butler. Thank you, Dr. Butler, for that presentation. And we're going to move on to our last strategic plan update, Dr. Shandler. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pearson. So I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Angie Siders if she'll come forward. She is Associate Director <laughs> in School Administration and Compliance. She's going to present on the strategic plan as well this evening, Goal 5, Objective 5-6, five, um, Safety and Security. I'll turn it over to Ms. Siders. Good evening, Mr. Richardson, members of the board, and Dr. Shandor. Thank you for this opportunity to present information concerning Goal 5 of the Strategic Plan regarding safe and secure educational environments. The focus of Goal 5 is efficient and safe operations. The York County School Division will maintain efficient, effective, service-oriented operations supporting student achievement in safe and secure environments. One of the most important objectives of Goal 5 is about the implementation of procedures which support safety and security. 
YCSD staff work proactively to enhance building safety and provide training in accordance with the division policy and state regulations. We collaborate with the York Pocosin Sheriff's Office and the York County Department of Fire and Life Safety to ensure a comprehensive plan is in place for our students and staff. The YCSD plan for safe environments focuses on implementing efficient building procedures at all schools. We provide professional development for all employees, including new employees that are hired throughout each year, such as the session with secondary assistant principals that you see in the above picture. Students and staff practice being safe by participating in several safety drills each year, which assist us in focusing on continual improvement at all times. Staff members support safety measures by first establishing positive relationships with students and parents, and that is based on research. Greeting students from the time they come on the bus in the morning and standing at classroom doors during arrival, dismissal, and class changes ensures that we pay attention to what is going on in our schools. Monitoring outside areas is also important to the overall school safety. The division provides safety training on topics such as building security and workplace safety. Training takes place for all staff in professional development sessions as well as online through the division's safe schools modules and other topics. All school administrators have been trained in PBIS while our school psychologists also provide training on mental health topics to staff members. Although it seems simple, having basic safety procedures for staff members to follow keeps schools safe. Being aware of what is happening around us is key. Communicating with persons inside while outside, providing safety information for subs, and reporting what we see are important proactive measures. A series of safety drills are held each year as part of our safety plan. YCSD follows guidelines established by the Virginia Department of Education. In addition to the lockdown and fire drills, the division practices earthquake and tornado drills. The YCSD Quick Reference Safety Guide continues to provide critical information to staff members for whenever a crisis event may occur. As you can see, we added hold in place to the guide. This procedure ceases all hallway movement in case of a medical emergency. The reference guides are located in all YCSD classrooms. An important part of the lockdown drill process is working closely with the York Pocosin Sheriff's Office and York County Department of Fire and Life Safety. During the drills, the team monitors, assesses, and has a debriefing following the lockdown drills. Debriefing with law enforcement provides critical feedback to administrators, which allows us continuous improvement for our process, which is then shared with staff members and students. The YCSD reported option provides four ways for students, parents, and community members to report any concern which threatens the safety of our students and staff. As you can see in the above graphic, concerns can be reported to an adult the YCSD hotline, the YCSD website, or the YCSD app. Reports are retrieved and investigated daily. The best safety plans include procedures for how to support students in emergency situations. The Safe Schools training previously mentioned highlights how to care for students preventively and when injuries may occur. In addition, all student medical alerts are entered into Aspen for staff member awareness. Hands-only CPR training is now required for teacher recertification. Additional designees at each school are also trained in a full CPR program. Stock EpiPens are available in each school and building designees are trained on how to use them. Thanks to the support of the board, we have expanded our safety focus for athletics by providing athletic trainers at middle schools in addition to the high schools already in place. Each year, teachers and coaches provide safety instruction that teaches students how to appropriately use equipment on playgrounds, during science activities, and in physical education classes and weight rooms. Access to AED units and trauma kits are available in each YCSD location. 
the availability of these items expands what can be accomplished in the event of an emergency prior to the arrival of emergency medical personnel. Staff members play a critical role in both establishing and supporting safe environments. The persons listed here support crisis situations when they occur and try to prevent them by supporting students and parents as needed, including assisting students with mental health needs. Thanks to the efforts of the board, the number of social workers has increased over the past few years. This year, division staff are appreciative that a coordinator of health services position was funded. The position also allows us to expand our focus on student safety because of our coordinator's medical expertise. She will provide training for the school nurses to meet the increasingly complicated medical needs of our students, including those with multiple disabilities. In addition to other duties, she will provide CPR, insulin, and glucagon training and assist with the monitoring of safety equipment. Building inspections continue each year by operations and maintenance staff. The interior and exterior of the building is reviewed. Staff members look for items that need to be addressed and ensure schools are safe and efficiently functioning. Information gathered from inspections helps the operations department plan for future projects. In addition to school inspections, playground inspections are conducted annually at each elementary school by the safety and compliance officer to ensure that there are no hazards. Moving forward, we will expand the number of buildings with the security vestibules, as we also focus on reducing the number of entry points where persons can enter our schools. We will expand the Division Safety Committee to include additional staff roles and parents. Professional development efforts will provide information from the Virginia School Safety Forum, positive behavior intervention supports, and knowledge about best practices for mental health needs. As I shared at the beginning of the presentation, failing to plan is, failing to, is planning to fail. YCSD continues to review practices and procedures to ensure safe and efficient learning environments. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this information. I'm now available for questions. Okay. Quick, quick question about the, the EpiPens. How, how are they distributed? To so like the clinic. Per, There's two in each school and they're in the clinic. Two in the each nurse. school mm -hmm. at every level? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. And there are report. Thank you very much. Two questions and, and I know they probably don't come under you and I can't recall where. And that and we can and it's nothing to answer tonight and it can come in the Friday report, but um, bus safety. And when I say that, here lately we've had so many across the country cars not paying attention and, and the devastation that they that has caused with uh, the death of a lot of students. Can we get a report just to say, have we, do we see that in York County? Do we see a lot of uh, drivers violating bus stops or buses on the highway? Um, but didn't know, uh, uh, I couldn't remember where that bus safety part went with that. And lastly, drugs in our schools, would, where would that fall under? In this school administration school administration and I said I think dr. Chandra I think I shared with you I can be different places across the county and you still say you hear people say well, oh there are drugs in the schools there are drugs in the schools you just don't see them they're in the schools and you know I can't say much so it's it's uh, just what how prevalent is it if it's true and what are we doing to try to curtail that? So that to me is a, a safety issue. You guys want to respond to that? Aaron, do you want to respond to that? Or you can come in the Friday report, whichever, whichever. No, I'm just saying well, what, what we look at. So in addition to making sure that we have our, our, our SROs in the building that provide classes and training to our students at the middle school and high school level on the dangers of uh, using drugs and alcohol and different things, we also have scheduled for um, different searches that take place during the year, and there are certain things that we are working with the York County Sheriff's Office on coordinating sometimes to do a couple of searches to look at certain things. That right, so you guys are familiar. We have the drug We dogs. do that, yeah, and, and once you hit one school, kids know it's coming to another school. You do, kind and of I, think, thing, so. I think, you know, 
as the years go by, kids kids are getting more creative, and they exactly. bring different items at times to hide what they bring to school. I know that was it called a jewel. Yes. So you know, a jewel looks like a jump drive, yeah. and so you know our. Our officers work very closely with our school administrators and teachers to identify these situations. And again, we're fortunate to live in a county where uh, kids will come to teachers or go to an administrator, or go to an officer to share that they saw something. So if they see it and they share it, then you know, administrators can, can investigate um, those claims. The, and else? also the SROs, you know, they get trained, they train the administrators at their building okay. as well on the what the new drugs and what they look like we get training as well okay thank you what are the legal ramifications can you do random searches i mean if you if you suspect certain pe people can you do random searches or? for the school division it's it, it has to be reasonable suspicion obviously it's not probable cause so once there's reasonable suspicion and carl you correct me if i'm wrong once they have reasonable suspicion then yes they can search <coughs> yes, you can so um, I read in the Friday notes about all the millions of dollars now available in grants to localities for work with local law enforcement and with school safety and things of that nature. Do you know if uh, YCSO is participating in that? And if so, do you, have you guys had conversations on how you're going to utilize that training? So you all know? No, we'll, what we'll do is certainly reach out to our contact through the sheriff's office to see what's available, see how we can collaborate on getting information in, in our schools so we can best be on the forefront of this if possible. So we'll certainly do that. I remember last year at the uh, dual session of December, you had a question about opioid because the opioid crisis was hitting. And there was some preliminary discussion sort of by the wayside about getting some type of report or something from the sheriff the county. county. Yeah, from the county. I don't recall seeing that. Um, so to, to go along with what she was asking about earlier. Um, when that article came out in the paper, and I think I, I when I copied and sent it to you, I know you all got the same thing, but it was the, com the, the both sides sitting and working together. And my comment with the superintendent was, do we have any data as to any type of opiate use in the county? You know, you can... Um, are we that clean, <laughs> you know? Uh, but I don't want to live, you know, like pie in the sky kind of situation. What kind of data, what, what are we seeing? And is there a concern or a growing concern? I think there's, there's certainly a concern, um, but I haven't seen the data yet. So I mean, I can certainly get with um, Sheriff Diggs, have some discussions with him, and I know that these guys work very closely with Calhoun as well. So, so we'll, let us get some information, and we'll share that with the board. And, there, and there's a new module with the Dare program that specifically talks about opioids and opioid addiction. Um, yeah, so you can teach all you know how, but they're still <laughs> oh, gonna find oh, them. No so doubt, it's no gonna doubt. yeah. The medical examiner yeah. probably has some type of state report on that. So, and Sheriff Dix may have that. We'll get that to you. All right, thank you, Ms. Siders, for that report. Very comprehensive report. Thank you so much. Uh, so next on the agenda, we have our final update of the evening, and that's the draft of the six-year facilities master plan. So, Dr. Shandle. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. All right, so um, the last presentation uh, is our Dr. James, um, Chief Operations Officer, and Mr. Mark Shearhart, Associate Director of Capital Plans and Projects. They're going to present to you the six-year facilities master plan. So. Um, this is quite a detailed presentation. It's a little longer than the other presentations, so we'll go ahead and jump um, jump right in. So I'll turn it over to Dr. James. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Mr. Richardson, the members of the board, Mr. Sherhart and I are pleased to share information with you about our six-year facilities master plan. The six-year facility master plan is what we call a comprehensive document. It gives us background and historical information about our schools, that's the age of our schools, when they were resolved, when they were rebuilt, because we think we need to capture that information because it's very important to us as we move forward. We also get enrollment and capacity data because that tells us what we need to do to make sure we have the classroom spaces available for students when they are needed. And also, as you know, the average age of our schools right now is 48 years. So we need to constantly address facility needs. Each year, a team composed, composed of myself, Mr. Shearhart, Mr. Dolak, and some other team members, we visit every school, go in every nook and cranny to see what we see, 
and we actually um, complete a facility analysis, and that charge complaint is contained in the FMP or the facilities master plan for each of our schools. That's very important information as we look to the projects that we need to put into the capital improvement plan. And the last bullet here talks about facility needs, of course, but then what are the projects that are going to be included in the plan? So all of that's in that document. A very important part of that document is information on new residential development. You have before you a sheet that talks about the new residential developments. It's there right before you. If you look at that chart or that sheet, it's divided into three areas. One is what's called active developments. Those active developments, and some of them have been on this chart for a number of years, it shows us where houses, townhomes, apartments are being built. It gives you the number of units planned, the number of COs or certificates of occupancy <coughs> to date, and then the number of future <coughs> units. The second part of that gives you those that are pending. Construction has not started, the site plan has not been approved yet, but they are working with the county on getting <coughs> approval for those particular developments. Some of them may be the first, maybe the second phase of the uh, projects that you see above you or the developments you see in the first part of the <coughs> chart. And lastly, we have those that are called planned developments. Plans means that they have talked to the county, the developers have, about these projects, but they have not submitted a site plan. So there are three types, active, pending, and plan. Next, I'm going to share with you some information about some of the new residential developments that are active. If you look at the screen before you, you'll see by school level, and I'm dealing with elementary now, the active developments in those particular <coughs> school zones. You will notice some of those developments are listed in green. The reason they're in green is because those are active developments, but we currently have students attending from those developments. So the numbers you see on the right side of that table, some of those students are already with us. Please keep in mind that these are only estimates from the county planner. Based on the type of home, the county planner has a multiplier that's going to predict the number of students that we should receive from those developments. Sometimes they're right on point, sometimes they're not because he, he cannot tell the, the dynamics of any family, but he's looking at typical history. What should we expect? So you can see here from the first group that uh, McGruder Elementary, with those developments planned there that are active, we could expect to see 178 more students. Going to the next table that completes the elementary schools, you can see, using what I just said, that Walla Mill Elementary, we can expect 280 more students. As you can see the reserve, we have students already from the reserve. I can tell you in the reserve, that's a pretty good size apartment complex, that they've gotten their first certificate of occupancy for the first building. So we can expect to see some students from those apartments in our schools. Nelson's Grant, we know where that one's located, right here on Route 17. It's still under construction. They are entering the final phases of that, but it's still an active development. But the one that uh, <coughs> tells me I, need, I really need to keep a watch on this would be Walla Mill and those 280 students. Ms. Haywood, you may see the name Powell Plantation on the chart. You remember several years ago, Syntex had purchased some land across from Walla Mill Elementary School right. to build Powell Plantation, and that was like 15 years ago, and nothing ever happened. But now I'm told another developer has purchased that property and they're planning on building single family homes. Ooh. And that's right across from Walla Mill Elementary School. Right. So that's going to be a huge plantation. But again, it's all about timing. I wish I had a crystal ball so I know exactly when they're going to be built out. But it's really hard to tell because they may stay on the books for years and you have no build out. And then some of them are going to be built very quickly, as was the case with uh, Yorktown Arch on Route 17. You remember about three years ago we had a <coughs> big discussion about Yorktown Arts because they built it very quickly and students came quickly. And sometimes with the new development, especially if it's rental property, then it may be a case where people move in and people move out. So your enrollment is going to fluctuate. And we've seen that happen at uh, Yorktown Elementary School. Moving on to the middle schools. 
Grafton Middle School, Commonwealth Green, the townhomes at Martin's Farm. Commonwealth Green, we know where that's located there, just past the theaters in the Peel Creek section of the county. They built out the apartments, but they're building duplexes now. You may see the advertisements in the paper for the mainstay at Yorktown. That's a part of the Commonwealth Green development. And of course, the townhomes at Martin's Farm, that's a development that just across the road from the school board office. I can tell you that's a quickly selling property. Sometimes I'll look at the daily listing of uh, real estate sales across the area, and you can almost see weekly see something for townhomes at Martin's Farm, but they do sell very quickly. Uh, the reserve, I just talked about that, Whitaker's Mill. Uh, Mr. Latch and I uh, met with the developer about a month ago, and his plan is to have that completely built out in two years. It's not built out now, but in two years. And of course, you know, that's a mixed-use development. Single-family homes, townhomes, and uh, duplexes. Uh, moving on again for the uh, middle schools, Tab Middle, Smith Farms. You know, that's a property next to uh, Mount Vernon Elementary School, next to Taylor Farms. There's been a lot of discussion about that, but they're not moving forward with that at this point. The others you see there that I've, I've already mentioned when I talked about the elementary schools. Again, for the high schools again, considering all of the development in the upper end of the county, Bruton High School at full build out said that we should expect 239 more students. But that's, again, that's the county planner's uh, estimate projection based on what he's seen in similar developments. And of course, townhomes at Martin's Farm and Commonwealth Green, you know, we've seen those before. And lastly, you see here at uh, Tab High School is only Smith Farms. Right now, that's active, and then York High School. I uh, talked about developments before, and of course, you see 82 for York High School. Rose Hill, that development's been out there for about five years now, and it's no, nothing happening with that. So with all of this information, it's important to remember that we don't know when all those students will appear, but we just need to have a plan to work through that as they began to uh, develop and students started to arrive on our doorsteps. One of the things I constantly do is just see what's happening monthly or so with all the new developments. What do I see? I'll talk to, to Mr. Cross at the county. He can tell me what he sees and what he's expecting so we have the latest information possible. Now, another very important part of this, considering what I've just shared with you, is going to be school capacity. As you know, about four years ago, I think, we developed the term instructional capacity. We felt we needed a term or another measure to talk about how classrooms are really utilized at the elementary level. At the elementary level, some of the pull-out programs, special education, English learners, drama if we're talking Walla Mill, dance if you're talking Walla Mill, computer classrooms, those rooms are included in the original building capacity. However, in an elementary school, K-5 instruction would not occur all day in those rooms. So you need enough classrooms to make sure all of your students are in a classroom space, and of course those other spaces are going to be shared. So when you look at that, you can see we have four schools. Bethel Manor, Coventry, Grantham Bethel, and Magruder, where the enrollment, and I'm talking K-5 enrollment, I'm not talking about preschool, where the enrollment is greater than the instructional capacity. The instructional capacity could change year to year based on how many classrooms are pulled out of the bank or regular classrooms and used for the uh, pull-out programs. At middle schools, you can see here in the middle schools because the way classrooms are used, the instructional capacity is the same as the building capacity because students are assigned to the art room and they rotate through their other five or their other six or seven classes. And you'll find the same thing happening with the high schools. So just to kind of sum up all this information, if you look at the analysis, we have the four schools where enrollment now is greater than the instructional capacity, some more than others. And we also have those schools that we know based on the data I just shared that Walla Mill, there are numerous students plan to come to that school. Yorktown, we still have a number of developments in the Yorktown zone still plan to come to that school. 
and then Queens Lake Middle School. As we know, that's a very small school. So it's smaller than actually Magruder Elementary School. But for all the students we just talked about early, when they do get here, then what do we do about capacity or space at uh, Queens Lake Middle School? That's one of the functions of the FMP and all the analysis we do. So how can we program spaces into the CIP to meet that need? Again, I'll remind you that that target is not set. It's hard to know when. It's something we just have to monitor. So what's our plan? And this has always been how we responded to enrollment growth. It's utilize temporary classroom spaces. You know, Yorktown and Elementary and Magruder are two prime examples of classroom spaces. We do have two other schools that have trailers on site that are used for storage and not used for classrooms and two of our elementary schools. Some of those are ones that are beyond instructional capacity right now. Uh, and another one, and we did this last year, was to adjust attendance zones as feasible. Build additional classrooms. We've done that in several of our elementary schools. Because Ms. Haywood, you can remember, we first renovated the high schools, went to middle schools, and then we started to renovate and add on to the elementary schools. It seemed like the plan has worked because we have the capacity at the elementary level when we needed it. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion about when do we construct a new elementary school? Based on some of the numbers we talked about with Waller Mill, Magruder, and Yorktown, when do we build that new elementary school? This year, as we look to place uh, projects into the CIP, we use a decision analysis of all of the projects. And we rated the projects based on some of the criteria you see here. As we know, age and condition have to be very important considerations. Our builders' average age is 48 years old. Grantham Middle School, Grantham High School has been around since 1996. And typically when you get at the 20 year mark, you know you need to start to do something with the HVAC and the roof. You know, we did some work at Grantham a couple of years ago, it took us two summers to take care of the roof issues there. But that's an important consideration. Safety, uh, Mrs. Scientist talked about security vestibules. We know that's an important consideration and how we can best help our schools to control the entry points, and that's something we're working on. Student achievement. How, does, how will the projects and the <coughs> CIP affect student achievement? Efficiency of operations. Energy uses. You've heard Mr. Shearhart talk about LED lighting. Some of our buildings are geothermal. You know, now we're looking at variable refrigerant flow for the HVAC systems to make sure that our, we can be as efficient, energy efficient wise as possible. Growth, how do we address growth? How do we increase instructional capacity? And then in any project, you know there's a cost of delay. The architects tell us anytime you know you need a project and every year you wait, you can increase 5% to the cost of that particular project. And equity, how are we across the division of all schools getting what they need? So this is some of the criteria we used this year. We had a CIP committee Mr. Bowen, Mr. Shirat, myself, Mr. Dolat, uh, Mr. Mead, uh, Mr. Tom um, and uh, Margaret Kirk and the finance office all sit on that committee because everyone has a role in how we work through these projects from conception until we finally get through uh, actually getting it paid for. So this has been quite a unique, but I think it was a very interesting process, it gave us a lot of value. And we hope to continue that throughout the year, even though we are done with the projects now for FY20. But we need to look at it as we continue to go with some of the things that, that I actually talked about earlier. So with that, before Mr. Shearhart, and he's going to lead you through all of the projects that are in this, uh, in the FMP to be included in the CIP. And next month, Mr. Bowen, as you know from the FMP, we go to the CIP based on any feedback that we see tonight about the projects that may be included, and then how we adjust before we bring to you a draft of the CIP for your consideration before you ask you to approve it at the end of January. So before we turn to Mr. Shearhart, are there any questions for me? It's, it's constantly moving. It's yes, constantly moving. So we, got a, we got an email last week that someone was inquiring about if we ever considered going solar. Has there been any discussion about that? Well, I'll tell you one thing Mr. Shearhart does. He constantly goes to the medical council, whatever that group is, that you go, what are the latest trends for us? And then how, we, how can we best leverage those within our schools? So we're looking at all of the technologies and see what's possible for us to include as we look at a project. 
So yes, I guess yes. would be the answer. Yes, we consider we all as opt-ins. Yes. Okay. You, you got a yes I, out of that? I got the yes out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, he looks at it. Yes, it's, we it's look at that. We haven't included as an opt yet. Effective. But we got to look at all the costs and, and, and return on investment for all of that. Yeah. And how can we best put that in our schools? All right. Thank you, Dr. Jane. You're welcome. Mr. Shearhart. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, now it's my turn. <laughs> Let's uh, go, go into some of the capital improvement projects we have, a, a few on the list here. As you know, these capital improvement projects, uh, major projects, some of them are major projects, some of them are minor. Some of the major ones we have are the HVAC repair and energy management, and also the roof repair and replacement. Those are two of the most costly uh, projects that we do in our, in our schools throughout the year, besides building them. The other, some of the other projects we have on the, on the plate here are uh, locker room renovations, uh, some restroom re renovations, renovating the York High School annex, and a few other few other uh, smaller projects like that. So I'll start off with the elementary schools. So you see here, I'm I'm going to focus on FY19, which is what we're in now, and then also in FY20, because that's basically what we're voting on. You're, you're going to be voting on for this this cycle, and so the FY21 through 25 is basically part of a planning document. You're reviewing the FY19 because there were some adjustments to those dollars. Yes, yes. So there was adjustments to FY19. You see here the first one there, Coventry Elementary School. Uh, you can see there's six hundred eighty-five thousand dollars to build to cre create a security vestibule there at Coventry Elementary. Also, we have we're replacing the metal roof there for one 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 million six hundred five thousand dollars, and then also at Coventry we replaced some of the air conditioning. We replaced the, the original building air conditioning a few years ago, but the additions hadn't aged out at that point in time, so now it's time for us to go ahead and replace the air conditioning and the additions. There's 12 classrooms there. It consists of three different additions to the building. Each, each addition had four classrooms in it. And then for security, you see here at Dare Elementary School and closing the breezeway, one of our primary uh, goals here is, is to maintain security, uh, safety and security of the schools. That's why we're gonna do that there in, in the FY19 money. You notice down then, their elementary school, you see the low, low slope roof, uh, coating the low slope roof in FY20 for $623,000. Uh, that's basically repairing the existing roof that's in place now without tearing it all off, and then we're gonna coat that roof and give us a 20 year warranty on it. Uh, we wanna do that to preserve this roof and to give us longevity in that roof and make it last as long as possible in a cost effective way. Uh, then next down, you'll see Mount Vernon's enclosed the breezeway and create a security vestibule at that school. You see we had $225,000 in 19, and then we have in FY20 another $900,000 there. The next project you see at the top there is Seaford Elementary School, and this is for a six-classroom expansion. It, this does include a roof coating, which is similar to what we're doing at DARE, and also window replacement, media center, and a main office expansions. The windows there are the original windows. Uh, they are single pane and uh, no, win no gaskets around the windows or anything, they leak like a sieve. Uh, so that, that project is, is, we expect that project to cover two fiscal years, FY21 and FY22. Then we'll go through the middle schools. Here are some middle school projects. Um, <clears throat> the biggest one of these I want to touch on is, um, is the Queens Lake expansion. You see in FY22 for $882,000 we have the A and E for that project and then the project actually takes place over FY24 and 25 and that includes an eight classroom expansion and creating a security vestibule. We'll bump out the front of the cafeteria there and create a, a security vestibule in the front of that school when we're over there. Oh, I wanted to back up here. One of the things I wanted to sh say here in FY21, you notice there the Queens Lake renovate locker rooms, Tab Middle renovate locker rooms, York Middle renovate locker rooms. When the locker rooms, when the buildings were renovated a few years ago or years ago, now the <coughs> locker rooms were not updated. They were not modernized. Uh, not exactly <coughs> sure why that didn't take place, but the Yorktown Yorktown Middle locker rooms are, were built in 1954, so they are due for an update. So Grafton Complex, we have a continuing project there. As you know, this coming summer, we'll be starting the HVAC replacement project there. When we're in there replacing the air conditioning in the building, this will start on the, the high school side this summer and then move to the middle school side next summer. Um, the, um, 
this, this uh, while we're replacing the HVAC and controls there, we'll also be installing a, or creating a security vestibule at both of the main offices at the front of the school, and also at the high school attendance office, there'll be a security vestibule there. So we're actually creating three at that school. And also we're renovating the main offices. So we'll totally gut the main offices there, reorganize them and redesign them, give them more practical, useful space, and also rotate the offices so that they're facing the front entrance. Right now you have to, I mentioned this before in my other reports, that you have to walk down the hallway, take a left, and then you, to get to the main office, that's kind of crazy. Uh, but I guess when they designed a the building, it made sense. Uh, the next, probably, next set is the high schools here. And, and now we are in FY20 here, you see there's $75,000. This is for A&E for a Bruton Zone bus parking lot. We're trying to relieve pressure on, uh, on Magruder. They currently have 15 buses parking there. So it's 15 buses and possibly up to 30 vehicles for drivers and aides and everything else on those buses. So it's, it's jam-packed at Magruder, and so we're trying to relieve some pressure there. Uh, we need to hire a civil, a civil engineer to look at a couple of different sites where there's a possibility of either leasing some land or building on some land we have and to relieve, relieve the pressure on Magruder there. So that's what that $75,000 is for. Then, then in uh, 21, you see the uh, actual construction of the bus, uh, bus parking lot for the Bruton Zone. Uh, then again here, you see the Bruton High School locker rooms, Bruton High School restrooms. Uh, you also have the Tab High School locker rooms. Again, these spaces were not renovated when they are not uh, updated or modernized when the building was renovated. We do have a, a cash funded project here. That's the green $500,000 and that's for creating a learning commons at Bruton High School. So the rest of these figures on the, on the, on the chart here that are in black are scheduled to be funded through bonds. And the, the numbers you see in green are the, for the cap cash funded. And again, so er, everything, Everything from FY21 on to 25 is all for planning purposes. These, none of these are cut in stone here yet. We're mostly focusing on FY19 and FY20. <clears throat> then if you go down here, some more high school projects. You, the first one here you notice is the, is the TAB High School HVAC equipment and controls. At that time, it's the best time to create a security vestibule. That school is Giving, giving us the most uh, challenge to put a security vestibule in there just because of the way the school is designed. Um, so we, that's what the plan is there to create a security vestibule at that point in time in uh, fiscal years 24 to 25. Uh, this again will be a two, over two year, two fiscal years. Um, another one I want to touch on here is York High School. You see the coating the roof, replace coating the roof there, low slope roof, FY19 for $1,620,000, but we can't get to the second phase because of funding constraints until FY21. So you see the extra, the other $2,131,000 there. So we'll go do far, part of the roof, and then we'll come back and finish up the roof in FY21. You see York High School, you school annex there for $495,000 in 19. Now again, we're, right now what we're trying to do, we're trying to hire an architectural firm to get in there and start the design work on that. We're actually meeting for interviews this Friday and Monday, uh, next Monday, uh, to, to select an architectural firm to start on this project. Uh, next, last project on this sheet is York High School. You see here the Creative Learning Comics, again, it's scheduled in FY20, and that is supposed to be a cash-funded project. Some of the other projects we have on the plate are um, the modular classrooms, this $200,000 each year is, is to pay for leases on the cur current uh, modular classrooms and also uh, get additional leases for future class uh, modular classrooms we might have to add at the schools due to um, enrollment uh, growth. Uh, video services, this is a shared service we have with the, uh, the county video services for replacing their equipment. Right now they're upstairs uh, videotaping this uh, board meeting and uh, we're, we want them to keep current equipment there, so this is our portion of that shared service paying for their equipment. Uh, the last project here is the new elementary school. You see here in the, uh, the first set of numbers there, all in green, is the A&E, and that funding is coming from uh, the stabilization funds, and it's in, in green there because we're counting it as cash-funded project. Uh, then the last there you see in FY 22 and 23 we moved the, the new elementary school out and uh, we've also had to increase it. Dr. James referred to cost of delay 
you see the cost of the delay on this school has gone up from $23 million, now it's $29,756,000. Due to the delay. Who do you attribute that to? It's just, just economy, the economy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so this is the last slide. Uh, and you can see on here the amount that we have uh, anticipated being bond, funded by bonds. Uh, it's not, uh, it's expensive to maintain the buildings and it's as expensive, you know, it's expensive to build a building, but it's also expensive to maintain the buildings. And if we don't maintain the buildings, we're gonna have to build new ones eventually, and then it's gonna be very expensive. So um, just to show you what our capital bonds are, you see the cost, the cash, projected projects for cash, and then you see the grand total at the bottom. So it's, it's a very expensive process to maintain these buildings and build new ones. And I'm willing to go back to any of the slides if you have any questions about the middle schools or elementary schools or any of those. So do you have any questions for me? Can we go back to slide 20, please? <coughs> okay. And on slide 25, is that total correct? No, nope, that's not correct. Well, yes, it is. What that last column there totals up the from FY twenty to twenty five. It does not include the the current year. Oh, gotcha. Nineteen is already funded. Right. Yes, nineteen is already funded. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. James and uh, Mr. Shearhart, for that presentation and. For everybody that presented the night and all the hard work you put into that, it's a great job. So, real quick, <coughs> next, next steps for this process. The next step for this process next month, Mr. Bowen is going to present to you the proposed projects for the capital improvement program, which are going to be those projects that you saw presented tonight. And if we need to make any modifications, and we'll share that information with you. But the plan now is, if there's any feedback from the board for anyone about any of these projects before he comes back to you next month to give you a layout of the capital improvement program. My apologies. I do have a question about this real yes. quick. So you know that we can pretty much determine the effective student population based on the <coughs> price of the homes. The data shows that the lower the price, the more likely there's going to be children in the home. So are these developers sharing the average home price with you as you meet with them? and? Is that, what the, is that part of their calculations as to the projected number of students? Right, because what the county planner does in his department, look at those types of homes and the expected market price of those homes, and then look at similar homes historically to determine how many students we can expect from each, each development. And as you said, it varies based on the type of home. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. All right. Perfect. So um, I think most of the board members will be attending the uh, Virginia School Board Conference in Williamsburg. Um, I guess that's next week, November 14th through 16th. We'll be there, but our next regular school board meeting will be Monday, November 19th at 7 p.m. And if there are no further comments, this work session is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.